Hey, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Well, welcome to Blue Lava. Oh, good. Glad, glad to be here. Um, could you share a little bit about your background and, 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 and could you actually explain what hardened JavaScript is for those who are listening who may not know the term? Yeah, uh, so hardened to JavaScript is JavaScript, but hardened, right? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I, so so my, uh, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do with my time is to take you all, web developers, from probably your starting position, which is JavaScript, isn't that sort of inimical to security? Isn't security kind of impossible in that language? Isn't it really hard um, to wait? No, this is the one most obvious popular programming language to use for this purpose. Uh, so, yeah, so hardened JavaScript is JavaScript, but it had with, with some additional features that we've baked in uh, in order to lock down the environment to make it. Uh, less vulnerable to prototype pollution attacks and a number of other things and basically build a platform for what we call object capability programming, which is, which is simply if, if you can, the, the only way to do a thing is to be given a reference to a thing that can do it. Uh, and, and that sort of gives us as programmers uh, a foundation to stand on for making, making, inferences about how secure our system is, if that makes sense. Oh, it does, it does. Um, so um, do you have a, do you want to be, a, how, how would you like to give your presentation? Yeah, I, I have I have some material to cover. It's about 20 minutes. Um, and if, uh, if, if you want to interrupt or if anybody in our, in our peanut gallery wants to interrupt along the way to ask a question or clarification or dig in, that's fine by me. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just go to town. Uh, yeah, so so uh, what is hardened JavaScript? So JavaScript provides this highly malleable scripting environment that makes it possible to run programs that were written by strangers on your behalf, right? So like in a web browser, uh, we are running programs that, that were written by strangers on our own machine, and we want to be safe when we do that. And JavaScript was designed for this kind of kind of thing. Right, and we have, and the, the reason why we do this is, is you know, it goes back a really long way. We have a really long tradition in software of building systems that increase interactivity with the user by sending programs to the user instead of just sending data. And uh, like, if you go back to the VT100 terminal and the earliest web browser, I think that you could make an argument that anytime you're installing an app on anything, on your desktop, on your phone. The reason you're doing that is so that the app can intermediate between you and, uh, and, and some service. And by doing that, you kind of are putting yourself in a position of vulnerability to the person who wrote that program. Um, and, and the web takes this very seriously. Apps and app stores uh, take it a little bit more seriously. But in general, you're putting yourself in a position where you could be installing a virus on your computer and you need to have uh, a platform that makes it safe to do that. And JavaScript was designed to do that. Um, so, the, so, so, so to have interactivity, we need to be able to run other people's programs. But running other people's programs is dangerous. And some people even tell you that you really shouldn't. Um, I'm here to tell you that you can, and you can use hardened JavaScript to make JavaScript safe for this kind of, uh, for the kinds of things that we're writing smart contracts for. Um, and, and by way of a metaphor, in the Odyssey, you might remember that Odysseus encounters the sirens, who are these dangerous creatures who live on an island. And uh, the the way the way that they they lure uh, they lure sailors on to crash into the rocks on the edges of their island uh, by singing them a song. And the song takes over their minds and makes them so that they all of these sailors just jump off of their boats and swim onto the island and drown. And uh, it, this is, of course like a classical metaphor for running strangers programs off of the internet, right? Um, is like, but, but what we want to be able to do is just to listen to those songs and enjoy them and understand them without giving the sirens control of our motor functions, right? And so how do you do that? Why do, and, and why do you do it with JavaScript? Well, it's, it's no accident. We, use, we made JavaScript for this purpose. It's designed to run sandboxes. Um, and 
the idea so, so like in a web browser though the interaction model is that you have it's it's your the, the parties involved are your yourself and the person who wrote this program right and you're when you're running this program you're making yourself when you're running this program you're making yourself vulnerable to the stranger who who crafted up the web page and javascript being this highly malleable programming language makes it possible to invite those programs to run uh but it only but it's based off of this rapidly deteriorating fiction that the only interested parties between uh, involved in a web application are the the user and the author of the program that's simply not true anymore hasn't been possibly ever um right because you have your uh there's the the service there's the vendors who provide data and, and services to the service so, so that they can do something work do work for you there's um and there are the attackers to that service as well. And uh, like, and if you have an advertiser or if you have some uh, some data service provider, all of those people are are involved in providing your application up. Um, and really, the one thing that you that you that, that, like you probably have a blind spot for is that all of that software has dependencies, and is and so those dependencies are an attack vector that all of these programs are vulnerable to. So, so the idea that there are only two parties in a web page and that this interaction model of just the user agent and the, and the author of the, of the program are the only, only things that need to be sandboxed is, is, is just false. So how do you get around that? Well, the, tr the way you get around that is by hardening JavaScript. And JavaScript, of course, has benefited tremendously from how malleable it is, right? It has made it possible for the language to evolve without significant backward inco incompatible changes for decades. Uh, but that malleability is what makes it vulnerable to things like prototype pollution attacks. And so what we do with hard JavaScript is we use that uh, pervasive malleability we have in the language to and turn it in on itself, right? So we take, we take JavaScript and we use the primitives that we have laying around to turn it into uh, a language that is not vulnerable to those kinds of attacks and also makes it suitable to invo invite multiple parties to interact uh, and even to interact in object-oriented ways that the typical programmer can, can understand. So, um, but some of the things that, that JavaScript has baked in from the beginning are super useful for our purposes, right? So a JavaScript program has memory safety, which means that you can't wander around in memory looking for pointers to powerful objects. And like if you have a kernel function from your operating system, it isn't necessarily exposed to JavaScript. In order to call a function, you need to have a, a reference to a function that calls the kernel function. And uh, you, can deny, uh, you can deny programs access to just about any powerful capability. The, uh, and then the other thing about JavaScript is it has this uh, lexical scoping, right? So if, if I were to write a function in a closure, I can have private data within that closure and the language guarantees that outside of that object that, that those references are not accessible unless you write a program that explicitly grants whomever calls a function and access to that reference. Um, and, and so, even though JavaScript wasn't born really suitable for co-tenant programs, it has this strict mode, which eliminates features like arguments, the arguments object, which uh, would have exposed uh, dynamic scoping problems, being able to see who called you, et cetera, all the way up your scope chain and manipulate their arguments. Um, so hardening uh, involves using the strict mode feature, which is about 10 years old now. And uh, and now, and then about 10 years old, uh, 10 years ago, they all, uh, with with champions like our own Mark Miller, we added object freeze and object property descriptors to the language, makes, which makes it possible to make an object, uh, its surface tamper-proof. It can still have mutability behind the scenes, but if I take this object and give it to two different people, they're not going to be able to use that to talk to each other if they're not intended to be able to talk to each other. Uh, uh, they won't and and making things like the array prototype tamper proof is what makes hardened javascript in uh safe against prototype pollution attacks so let's think like of a concrete example suppose that you have a pro suppose that you have a program and you want to expose an api to some end user and uh you but you want to be able to 
have the user be able to ask of the server arbitrary questions about the data that they have. And this is more practical than sending all of the data at every user because the data is itself is in a, is is amorphous, constantly changing, um, and and not the same and huge. Um, so what we what we want to do is be able to have the server run programs that the user has authored, and the way we make this safe typically is by using hobbled programming languages that don't really give you a lot of capability. Um, like uh, like sending a SQL program, for example, um, and, and even that's a bad example because SQL itself is is quite powerful. Um, so, what we want to do is be able to send a JavaScript program, but then but using a na this naive, malleable JavaScript and just using eval for a stranger's program is obviously silly, uh, because that program can read the database from is, which is probably a variable in the scope of the query. It can call any method of any object. It can modify anything in the prototypes. Uh, it, it can modify variables in scope. It, was, it can, uh, and then it can reach out to powerful modules like uh, like your file system or your networking libraries and do just about anything that any computer can do with the power of the user. And that's clearly unacceptable. Um, so hardened JavaScript provides alternative solutions to this problem. Uh, so in hardened JavaScript, uh, you can you can use a different set of evaluators. And contrary to pop popular popular wisdom, eval isn't evil, uh, and this is easily proven because the Levenstein difference between eval and evil is uh, one. That's that's not zero. That means they're not the same. But that's a bit of a stretch. I'll admit. Um, there. Eval does have a lot in common with evil. It's like the oldest and most powerful form of eval is a direct eval, the, the literal eval keyword in the language. And with this, you can run a program, and that program inherits the caller's scope. It can use dynamic scope. It can in do weird things like introduce variables in the caller's scope to overshadow things uh, that, that they have. Um, and if you go back to that classical metaphor, this would be like... Uh, giving the, the sirens the ability to decide what undefined means for every program that shares that scope. Uh, then then after that, there's a, some, a, a lesser eval, if you will. That's indirect eval. This is a minor reformation of eval late, added late to the language that allows you to take eval and use it in any way except for as a, a, a function. Uh, like you can... Uh, you have to rename it or capture it in an expression or something like that. In that case, instead of being dynamically scoped, it reads uh, it reads off of the global scope instead. And this helps, but it's it's clearly not enough. And then there's another subtle eval function constructor, uh, and and this is the subtle eval that allows you to to run a, a function body in global scope. But even then, uh, you're still even with we even with this subtle eval, there's a, you're vulnerable to a whole bunch of things, including prototype pollution attacks. There are a lot of ways to subvert it. Um, so instead, what we do is we use hardened JavaScript. Now, hardened JavaScript is kind of like, uh, if, if you remember another classical thing, uh, Gaul. It's like Gaul because it's divided into three parts. Uh, it has a lockdown function, a hardened function, and a compartment constructor. And then with these three devices, Lockdown, which prepares an environment and makes its makes the uh, environment immutable. Harden, which allows you to defend your own objects and APIs. And compartments, which create evaluators that are isolated and only have access to these hardened shared intrinsics and anything else that you have explicitly granted your program. These give you the ground to stand on to defend the design of your program against attackers. So what Lockdown does is it prepares the shared primordials, or so sometimes called intrinsics, objects that are like the array and the object and object constructors and their prototypes. And then it goes on and fixes some of the features of the language so that, uh, that the, the programs that use them can't interfere with each other, like uh, deleting, uh, uh, deleting the ability to, net, uh, to get access to high-resolution timers by default. Um, they can be granted back if you understand the risk of granting back timers um, and, and, and take other measures to protect against that problem. 
Um, but you can also, rem it also removes unrecognized methods in the environment just in case, and it freezes everything, uh, everything that will be shared, that is. Some of these objects are subtle, like uh, like the iterator prototype and the async function prototype, which you can only get, which, you, which anybody can get by using JavaScript syntax and doesn't necessarily need access to global scope. So we go and find all of those things and harden them on your behalf. And then we, uh, then we freeze the transitive properties of all these things, and that makes the entire environment pro uh, tamper-proof. Uh, then uh, Lockdown also prepares the Harden function and the compartment constructor. The harden function. Uh, the harden function is for you. The, is, so, uh, what what lockdown does is it creates this environment where you can defend yourself. And to defend yourself, you need to harden your own APIs. Anything powerful that you're going to give to somebody else, uh, make them tamper proof. And then once you're on that on once you're on that ground, you can make reasoned decisions about what powers you're going to grant other other strangers. And then the compartment constructor is an object that gets its own personal global scope and that global scope only contains these frozen intrinsics and anything that you've injected into the compartment at the uh, by adding it to the global object uh, you then have the option of hardening the global object and if you and and, the, and with that you get some more guarantees but the, the, the point of it is that you get an eval function that you can give strangers code to, and it won't be able to escape that, that environment, and it will only have the capabilities that were granted to it. So within a compartment, prototype pollution attacks are not really possible. Um, and then you have the hardened function. You can't do things like subverting the definition of NAN. You can't redefine math. You can't munge the shared prototypes. You only get what I gave you. And so returning to our concrete example, we could write, uh, we can write an API that allows us to run JavaScript queries on our server with limited vulnerability. Now there are, there are things that still can happen, like you can limit, avail uh, a, a an attacker could limit availability by running a, uh, an infinite loop. There are other ways of getting around that problem that, uh, and, and, and that goes beyond hardened JavaScript, things like metering. Um, the, so the application would, to do this needs to arrange a compartment in which to run the queries. And because the compartment is going to be shared with multiple parties, what we do is we freeze that global this right on top. That makes it so that everything is frozen. Then, because we want to be able to inject individual items into the scope of a query, we capture that compartment's special function constructor, which only runs functions in the, in the scope of that compartment. Um, and then we use Harden. And we use Harden to do things like uh, hardening the arguments that we give the program and the objects that we get out of it. Um, then, uh, th with this arrangement, the queries can't directly act access the database because they don't have access to a reference to the database object. They only have the ability to look at individual items from the database. So they can't stage a man-in-the-middle attack or exploit re-entrance by polluting the shared array prototype or any of those kinds of things. And if you want to defend yourself against re-entrance, you can do more things like ensuring that any, any method of a stranger's program gets executed in a separate turn of the event loop. So then they can't access the file system because they don't have access to the module loader and they don't, and so they can't go off and grief the file system or do worse. And then they have access to these power, they don't have access to these powerful modules, that these, these things that we call ambient authority, powerful objects that are just laying around and uh, that any part of your program can use without asking you. Um, so the, this is in contrast to the common approach to creating sandboxes, which relies on a more coarse boundary uh, called a realm or an even coarser boundary called the, 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 the inter-process boundary. Uh, and that's, and so the realms are like iframes or what the V8 calls a VM context. And with those approaches, each tenant program gets their own unique set of primordials, like their own array constructor. The problem with this, though, uh, that we can overcome with hardened JavaScript is that there ends up being this identity discontinuity that the array from one realm is any array from one realm is not recognizable as an array to another another uh, another realm and that makes them sort of chemically incompatible and ultimately while separate realms can defend against explicitly partition uh, explicitly partition programs you might find that the enemy's already within the gate so all modern software is running in this crowded house regardless of whether they can do so safely they all have they're all vulnerable to their dependencies, their software supply chain. 
and you know, a modern JavaScript program consists of around 3% novel code, the code that you write, and the rest of it is all dependencies, and you have to keep those up to date. And every time you're updating a dependency, you have this terrible bargain you have to make. On the one hand, you're thinking, well, if I update my dependency, that might bring in a new attacker. But on the other hand, if I don't, I might be failing to patch some security vulnerability in my system. There has to be a better way than having to make this choice. And our partners at MetaMask are using hardened JavaScript to build a tool called LavaMote that does that. And it, uh, the way it works is that it puts every third party dependency in its own compartment. And then through static analysis decides whether uh, each of those compartments needs to have any particular capability beyond uh, beyond the inert mathematical capabilities of a programming language. And to do that, uh, and then if it does that, it writes up a policy which does two things, one of which it tells the hardened JavaScript layer what to give that program. And the other is it tells you, the author of that application, what kind of risk you're getting into with that third-party dependency. Does this need network access? Does it need the file system access? Is it left pad? Why? Does it need those things? And then give you an idea of how closely you need to audit your third-party dependencies, many of which you don't need to look at closely because all they're doing is string manipulation. So together with, with our friends at MetaMask, we're building a new tool called Endo, which does that and also builds on top of our ESM module loader, which is built inside of compartments. And this is Endo's uh, uh, an anagram of node and like Dino. And the idea is to provide a secure, a credible security model for running strangers programs off of the internet in, uh, in an environment that can, that is more capable. Um, and we and members of the Agoric, pardon, the Agoric and members of the CES community, the hardened JavaScript developers are pursuing standardization of hardened JavaScript, but you really don't need to wait. We wrote a shim and that's what we're using. And, uh, and Modable, an, uh, an embedded systems company, creates a, a JavaScript engine called XS, and it implements all of these features natively. Uh, and, and at Agoric, we're using that as well for other purposes like snapshotting and metering. For Agoric, hardened JavaScript is the foundation that allows us to run these smart contracts determin deterministically and safely. It's part of this decentralized or uh, distributed operating system where prom we can use promises as proxies for remote objects, eschewing heavy RPC frameworks, and uh, and creating this much simpler and more familiar uh, programming model and having security as well. So why hardened JavaScript as opposed to anything else? Uh, so the, the, for one, it's the most popular programming language in the world, and it gives us, it makes it possible, it gives those programmers the ability to write secure programs, which is huge. But allow me to digress for a moment into my motivation for contributing to the project. I like exciting projects. And for me, an exciting project has three noteworthy traits. First, it's evident if the project succeeds, almost everything naturally comes to depend on it. And it creates a world that's new, it's bigger, cooperative, and safer, more accessible than the old one. Or the, and, and also that the project creates an explosion, a Cambrian explosion of diversity and activity. Uh, the second trait is that nobody really wants it. It's kind of exciting to have something of value that nobody knows is valuable yet. And the most uh, most people really just don't know about it. And then after that, you get to the people who know about it, but dismiss it because it's unlikely to get, trans you know, to get traction. And then there's also, uh, and a lot of people don't want it because it's inconvenient and it would require rethinking and retooling, all of which are fair reasons to not think about a project. Uh, but third... If you work on the project a little every day, it gradually makes its way up to some invisible watershed and shifts from being radical to being inevitable. And my experiences with this kind of thing are like, uh, like in 2006, I was working on modules for JavaScript. And at the time, nobody really wanted that. Uh, everybody was really happy topologically sorting all of their dependencies and script tags by hand. And that really was sufficient for all the things we were doing at the time. But if you think about it, the reason it was sufficient is because that's all you could do. And now with Node and NPM and CommonJS modules, we write a lot more types of software than we used to. And then from that, I, because of that experience, I met our Agoric's uh, chief scientist, Mark Miller, who's whispered in my ear that I really ought to learn about promises. And then I wrote this Q promise library. So if you think that getting 
JavaScript programmers to adopt modules was an uphill battle. Uh, just like knowing that JavaScript mod like modules in general are a solved problem in most languages and everybody knows what they're supposed to do. You'd think it would have been easier, but think about promises. Um, I, <laughs> we, it took a long time to, to convince people that promises were the way that JavaScript should work. And now, now they're just part of the language and it's, and I think that it's obvious now in hindsight that it makes it easier to program. And then on top of it, and we only breached the tip of the iceberg with promises. The next step with them is using them as a basis for communicating to third parties and other workers as proxies for objects and with giving programmers the simplicity of, of the object of object oriented programming for writing complex protocols. So I think you're going to hear about hardened JavaScript again. And the purpose, again, again, of hardened JavaScript is to realize this Cambrian increase in software diversity by allowing a greater degree of cooperation between programs. So, like Odysseus, please sail forth from here and listen to the siren song and live to tell the tale. That's me. Um, and I'm an, a software engineer at Agoric, and I work on hardened JavaScript with an incredible team. Um, and it's... Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking here, uh, and I'm open to questions at this point. Chris, there's a general question, which is where where should people go to learn more about this right now? Yeah, I uh, if you go to if you go to my Twitter stream, I post my the last message I posted was a link to the slides for this deck, which includes all of the hyperlinks for and and some code examples if you need some clarification or an, an idea about what that database looks like, um, and and that's that's the best place to start. There's, uh, we're on GitHub. This hardened JavaScript is a, an open source project. Uh, best place to look is uh, on GitHub under the endo.js org, the endo project uh, in the package sess. And that gives you, a, that, that's a good place to start on the documentation for hardened JavaScript. And there is a link in the deck for that. Fantastic. Yeah, so you can go to Chris's Twitter, which is at Chris Kowal, K-R-S-K-O-W-A-L. Yeah, and I'm I'm super looking forward to the next presentation from uh, our our friend Tom von Kutzum, um, and he's going to talk in much greater detail um, and with, with uh, about what hardened JavaScript is and what how it's layered.